Can we see your video of you, uh, if you like? Let me see how I can. Yeah, good. And now, can you still see the slides as well? Yeah. If I do this, is it? Oh yeah, that's working perfectly, yes. Great. Okay, let's get see. started. Okay, welcome everyone to this week's CDAC webinar. I'm pleased to introduce Kirsten Davio, former CDAC <laughs> student in our first talk from down under, that is New Zealand. <laughs> Kirsten's career trajectory is really quite interesting. She has two bachelor's degrees from Bard College in New York which she received in 2013, one in physics and the other in musical performance, specializing in classical voice. She then moved to Yale, where she obtained a PhD in geology and geophysics, and her thesis focused on silicon carbide and related materials and their implications for planetary interiors, including exoplanets. And there she worked <clears throat> under the supervision of Kanani Lee, who was then a a CDAC partner and now, of course, is at Livermore as a staff member. Kirsten then moved to Harvard, where she worked with Rebecca Fisher as a postdoc until earlier this year, and then moved to uh, the Toi Ahoy Mai Institute of Technology in New Zealand, joining its academic staff in engineering. So, welcome, Kirsten. Uh, it must be nice to be in one of the most COVID-free places on, pl on the planet. I'd like to see <laughs> questions about that. Anyway, we look forward to your talk. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. Um, it's great to be able to talk on Zoom, even though it's early in the morning here, and still can still be part of things going back, going on back home. Um, yeah, but so today I'm going to be talking about my PhD work on exploring the stability of silicon carbide at high pressures and high temperatures. All right, so Kanani and I did a lot of diamond anvil cell experiments on silicon carbide and related systems. And so today I'm going to go through a lot of these results and then some of the implications. Um, right, so before getting started, I just want to acknowledge the different institutions that I've been at um, since, while working on all of these things, right? So doing my PhD at Yale and then postdoc at Harvard, and then I actually came to New Zealand with an affiliation at the University of Waikato last year, and since have started at Toyohomai, where I'm beginning to introduce high pressure research um, to people here since it's not something that's very widespread in New Zealand right now. There's funding from CDAC, NSF, the Connecticut Space Grant, and then um, all of the work that we did at APS and the Beamline scientists who were, who were really helpful there. Um, so an outline today, first I'll be giving an introduction just about what silicon carbide is and why I wanted to work on it. And then I'll be talking about our experimental results of a pure silicon carbide system at high pressures and temperatures, looking at phase transformations and melting behavior. And then I'll go on to talk about some work that we did combining silicon carbide with other elements to look at different kinds of chemistry and stability in those systems. So starting with an introduction, Silicon carbide is you know, something that we interact with every day, right? If you do any kind of lab work, then you probably use silicon carbide in the form of sandpaper, right? So this image, you can get a 48 pack from AliExpress, though this might be an outdated <laughs> listing, right? But silicon carbide is very strong, it's very refractory, it makes a good, you know, a good sandpaper. It's also something that is found in heating crucibles in the lab frequently. And this graph I have on the right just shows that the silicon carbide, um, silicon carbide is applied in many industries from 
steel to automotive, aerospace, military, it's a very useful and common material. Right, so what the molecular structure looks like are these two figures down at the bottom. So it's composed of silicon carbon tetrahedra. Uh, here the carbon is these small brown circles and the silicon are the larger ones. Um, and so most of the work that I'm gonna be talking about is on the structure that's on the left here, the beta silicon carbide or cubic structure, which is also called the 3C structure and it's in the B3 or zinc blend, um, yeah, the name for the structure. And so at room temperature though, silicon carbide can take several different uh, forms based on the stacking sequence of these tetrahedra. So over here on the right is the hexagonal form, which we will talk about a little bit, but mostly focusing on the cubic structure. Right, and so while we interact with silicon carbide pretty much daily, it doesn't occur naturally on Earth in very high abundances. It does show up as the mineral moissanite, um, usually associated with very reducing kind of phase assemblages, so associated with diamonds or, you know, in these kinds of maybe deep mantle type assemblages. The other place that it shows up is in meteorites. So this um, image here shows material from the alpine foreland that was being investigated for a meteoritic origin. And it has a nice um, SEM image of these silicon carbide crystals, these moissanite crystals. Because silicon carbide is usually um, associated with pre-solar grains. So when you see it in a rock formation, you think this could be a meteorite. All right, and so what really captured my attention was thinking about silicon carbide as a major planetary building block rather than just um, an accessory phase. Right, so what I have here is this image on the left is a collage of actual photos of protoplanetary disks, right? So these are our baby solar systems. Um, and so when a star forms, right, from the collapse of a big cloud of gas and dust, and most of that material makes the star, but then a small amount um, forms disk, forms a disk around the star, which is the protoplanetary disk. And so the chemistry of the star it's pretty much identical to the chemistry of what's gonna be making your planets in that protoplanetary disk. And it was proposed that some stars that were very carbon rich would then give rise to carbon rich planets um, orbiting, right? And so this figure I have here on the right, these are model results, looking at how the carbon to oxygen ratio which is varied in these rainbow colored lines uh, with blue being a low ratio and red being a high ratio. That if you look at the distance from your star, which is the X axis here, and the weight percent of carbon that is precipitating out to form your planets in your disk, at high carbon to oxygen ratios, you have quite a high amount of carbon rich um, material available to make your planets. Right, so in a system like this, you would be forming your planets out of carbides like silicon carbide or iron carbide, rather than out of the materials that an Earth-like planet is made of, like silicates. Right, and so silicon carbide as a, a planetary component, as a major building block, is something that, you know, it's kind of out there and strange, and if you look at a plot of the C to O ratio of stars, right? So these are observations from astronomers looking at star chemistry. You know, this kinds of chemistry, C to O ratios that are higher than 0 0.6, 0 0.65, where you start getting significant amounts of carbon rich condensates, they're not terribly common, but they do exist. And so they represent a really interesting end member of what a planet very different from the Earth could look like. And so this, um, exploring this planet means that we need to understand silicon carbide um, at high pressures and high temperatures, right? So 
this is a simple figure looking at the pressure of different rocky planets in our solar system, right? And so if we want to think about silicon carbide in this context, we need to get um, an idea of what the phase diagram would look like. Right, so moving on in the outline, this is where silicon carbide at high pressure and temperature where our experiments began investigating. Right, so moving on to the pure system, we looked at two different aspects of it. So we looked at solid phase transitions in silicon carbide once you increased pressure. And then we also looked at melting behavior, right? Trying to get an idea of how and at what temperature silicon carbide melts. So for all of our experiments, we used the diamond anvil cell, which is shown here, right? So I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. Um, it's a little handheld contraption, right? Which right in the middle are two brilliantly polished diamonds in between which you put your sample and then whatever else you want to compress along with it. So usually we use a pressure media, which kind of acts like a little pillow to help distribute the stresses and make the sample chamber more hydrostatic, um, as well as some kind of a pressure calibrant. So something that we know the equation of state, how it changes with pressure very well, so then we can get a better idea of what pressure our sample is at. Right, so once that's all loaded in the sample chamber between the diamonds, then we compress the cell by you know, closing the two parts, screwing down these diamonds with these screws here, and applying force to the sample. And so just with this little contraption, we can get up to pressures of Earth's lower mantle um, with very, you know, with specialized diamonds, you can get much, much higher than that. And so once we have it at pressure, we can put this diamond cell in a focused laser and then that will increase the temperature, right? So a very finely focused laser right on the sample can bring it up to thousands of degrees, effectively recreating the conditions inside of a planet. Right, so we used several analysis techniques for these experiments. We did a lot of work at APS at sector 16 and sector 13, uh, collecting diffraction patterns. And then we also worked using the four color laser heating system that we had at Yale University, which worked by imaging the thermal emission of the sample while it was hot, which would give us a map of the temperature and some interesting observations about optical changes during heating. Right, so going to the first thing we looked at with silicon carbide, we looked at the transition to a high pressure rock salt structure, which is the, the image that I have here. Right, so jumping right in for diffraction data, this is probably easier for you since it's not 7 a.m. <laughs> But so what I have mental results, right? So I have despacing plotted down here at the bottom um, versus intensity. And so this bottom pattern is the starting preheat pattern where we have loaded a silicon carbide, that cubic B3 structure, along with neon, which is our pressure medium. And we find that as we heat it up, we observe the appearance of new peaks. So Right here, a little bit below a despacing of two, you can see this appearance of a really sharp new peak. And this is one of several peaks, which correspond to a new B1 cubic rock salt phase. Right, so what we're seeing is illustrated in these molecular cubes over here, going from a more open zinc blend structure to a more closed rock salt structure at high pressure. And so once we form this structure, we um, decrease, we decompress the sample, and we see that it sticks around until about 52 to 36 GPA. So down here I have the different phases labeled. So if you pick one of these B1 peaks, maybe one that's around, again, that one that's a little below two um, angstroms, then if you follow it down, it disappears by the time you get to 36 GPA. 
So we see some hysteresis in this transition, right? We formed it at 60, but at room temperature, when we compress it, it sticks around until about 40. Right, so if we plot the pressure versus volume for these phases, right? So at this top line here, this is that B3 um, ambient pressure zinc blend structure. It has a much larger volume. And then at high pressure with some heat, we have a transition to the B1 rock salt structure, which is a much denser phase. So I wanna emphasize this is a 20% density increase across this transition, which is very dramatic, right? And so we're not the first people to have seen this transition. Um, back in 1993, Yoshida et al. saw this transition at 100 GPA when compressing silicon carbide at room temperature. Right, and since we um, made these observations, several other studies have also confirmed and added more information to this phase transition. So this plot is a compilation of work looking at the transition from the zinc blend to the rock salt structure in silicon carbide. It's plotted in pressure versus temperature. The black symbols are all diamond anvil cell studies with these triangles from Kitakoru et al. in 2017, diamonds from Yosi et al. Um, and then our data are plotted in the circles here. Blue symbols are from shock experiments. And then red symbols represent um, computations. And so while there is a decent amount of spread, we see that the data is beginning to uh, make clear that this transition seems to happen at around 60 GPA. When you're at low temperature, it doesn't occur until higher pressures, but this is likely due to some uh, kinetic effects in the silicon carbide system. Right, so moving on to the other uh, work that we did on pure silicon carbide, we looked at the melting behavior. Right, so at ambient conditions, um, this is what the phase diagram of silicon carbide has been known to look like for you know, 50 years. So down here in atomic percent carbon on the x-axis, I'm looking at the 50% line, which is right in the center here, and that's the silicon carbon 50% silicon, 50% carbon line. Right, and so this silicon carbide begins to break down at 2540 degrees Celsius, right? So somewhere around 2900 Kelvin. But what's interesting is that it doesn't melt from silicon carbide solid straight to silicon carbide liquid. Instead, the silicon component comes out as a liquid with solid graphite. So you get decomposition of silicon carbide at this temperature rather than going from solid to liquid with the same composition. So this is interesting, especially thinking about silicon carbide in a planet, because if it were to break down, then that would um, be very different for your planet's chemistry rather than just a solid silicon carbide to a liquid. Right, so several studies had looked at the high pressure behavior, but with some conflicting results, right? So over here on the left, I'm showing results from Tagaya et al. in 1998. And so they're looking at pressure versus temperature and they find that silicon carbide melts again by decomposition, right? Represented by this liquid silicon plus carbon region of their phase diagram. And that as pressure increases, the temperature needed to begin melting also increases. This is in direct contrast, though, to a study that came uh, about 15 years later, where they saw that at high pressure, silicon carbide began to melt congruently, so without breaking up. And that as you increased pressure, you needed less temperature. So this, what we wanted to do was try to make sense of these results and extend these experiments to higher pressures. 
right? So again, jumping into diffraction results of our pure silicon carbide um, heating, right? So again, we heated that B3 zinc blend silicon carbide with neon as our pressure medium. Down here on the bottom, this first pattern is a preheat pattern where we just have the silicon carbide and our neon and some gasket diffraction. And as we increase temperature, right, we're looking to see either you know, the appearance of carbon, silicon, or maybe some kind of indication of melting. And what we do find is that carbon diamond diffraction begins to appear in the patterns. Right. What we also observe is that as you heat it, there's very dramatic optical changes in the silicon carbide sample. So down here, um, looking at this at pressure image of the sample, this is looking down map view at our sample chamber. The outer region is the unheated silicon carbide um, that's on the edges of the sample chamber and outside of the laser spot. This inner region that's transparent, right? So this light coming through is a backlit light. This is where the heating spot was focused, right? And right in the center is where it got the hottest. You can see it turned more opaque and dark in the center. And these features stick around even after the sample is decompressed, right? So you still have that more transparent region and then that darker um, more opaque region in the center in that decompression image on the right. All right, so we investigated these optical changes when heating to see do these correspond with this potential phase change melting behavior that we're observing. All right, so in this kind of busy figure, we're looking again at a silicon carbide sample that was just loaded with a pressure medium. This first image, white light after annealing, that's on the left, this is showing that the entire sample became more transparent after heating. So this is transmitted light. Immediately next to that image, this is looking at the um, light emitted from the sample while heating in this location, right? And then white light after that heating shows that that region of the sample became more transparent. It's a little bit brighter there. When we then heated at a higher wattage, this one 68 watts, we saw it become more transparent as well as achieve that little opaque region in the center. And this is even clearer when we look at our emissivity and temperature maps, right? So down here, I'm showing um, maps of the thermal emission that was collected in these little green boxes during heating, right? So at the lower temperatures, emissivity looks as we would expect with higher emissivity in the center of the sample where it's getting hottest and the laser is focused, and that this corresponds to higher temperatures in the center, right? So this is what we would expect. But at the higher temperature heating, the 68 watt heating, we again see high emissivity in the center, but this is no temperature map. Now we're beginning to see what appears to be lower temperatures in the center, which is not what we would expect and doesn't make sense with the emissivity map. So what seems to be happening is that whatever this, you know, this break up this phase change in silicon carbides melting behavior, this is causing optical changes in the sample, which then begin to alias the light so that you start to see um, uncorrelated temperature and emissivity maps. And so if we go through a whole bunch of samples, look at, at what temperatures this happens, we can begin to find kind of where this phase change may be occurring. Right, so just to double check and continue to explore if this is a decomposition phase change, we cross section several of our samples. So what I have here are images of a cross section of a sample. So here in the top left is the map view on this heated location, again with the transparent ring and the opaque center. 
which we've cross-sectioned with the focus ion beam. And that's this image right next to it, right? This is an SEM image. And then when we use the microprobe to take carbon and silicon compositional maps, we actually see that the carbon map lights up, right? And there's these regions of carbon enrichment, which is consistent with our appearance of carbon diamond in the diffraction. And these correspond to respectively silicon depleted areas. And while there's not any corresponding silica enriched kind of spots, this whole region has some um, areas that are slightly brighter in the silicon map. Right, so if we put all of this together um, onto a pressure temperature phase diagram, right, so we have the previous data, which is down below 10 GPA from Sokolov and Tagaya. And then our data are these solid symbols here, right, the circles represent the diffraction where we saw the appearance of carbon diamond in the sample. And then the triangles are where we observed that change in the optical characterization in the four color heating system. And so they're really well correlated, meaning that these um, two separate observations are likely corresponding to this same um, melting breakup of silicon carbide, the point where carbon begins to come out of this silicon carbide. Right, and so these two images up here, this is an interesting experiment because it was at pressures above this B1 transition, right, and at low temperatures where the kinetics may be too slow to transition to the rock salt structure, we still see signs of decomposition. But at high temperatures, where the kinetics would likely have you know, allowed the transition to the B1 structure, we no longer see those signs of decomposition, the diamond diffraction or those optical changes, um, meaning that potentially the B1 structure does not break up in the same way that the B3 structure does with carbon coming out of the silicon carbide. Right, and so this is kind of a weird shaped phase diagram with the room, uh, with the lower pressure data way up at higher temperatures, and then our data all falling somewhere around 2000 degrees. And so in order to try to make some sense of this data, we made a plot of pressure versus volume of all of these different phases and then looked at the volume change across this transition. So going from silicon carbide to silicon plus carbon, right? And what we find is that all of these phases have very dramatic volume changes as you go up in pressure because of solid solid phase transitions, right? So silicon carbide at the top, this is you showed before, goes through that jump um, in well, a jump in density or drop in volume from the B3 to B1 transition. Silicon goes through many different phase transitions at lower pressures, um, each with a density increase. And then carbon, of course, goes through the famous transition to diamond, again with a big density increase. And so if you combine the, all of these phases and consider the change in volume for silicon carbide to go to silicon plus carbon, what we get is in this dotted line here. So at very low pressures, when silicon and carbon are both in their um, most, you know, the largest volume unit cell structure, silicon carbide would gain volume by breaking up, right? it would, the change in volume across the transition is large and positive. But after silicon and carbon have gone through these high pressure transitions, that change in volume becomes negative. So that now by breaking up into silicon and carbon, the change in volume across that transition um, drops. This changes again, once silicon carbide goes through that high pressure transition all right, which is shown here by this jump. And so, you know, while it's not a hard and fast reason as to why this phase diagram looks so strange, it does 
at least correlate very well and so may have something to do with this kind of odd behavior. Right, so conclusions from the pure silicon carbide system. Right, so we find that it transitions to a dense rock salt cubic structure and that this happens at around 60 GPA. And that silicon carbide decomposes or carbon begins to come out of the silicon carbide system at temperatures of around 2000 degrees Kelvin when you're between 10 and 60 GPA in our experiments. Right, and again, what we keep finding is that kinetics is a big part of the silicon carbide system, right? So in the rock salt um, transition, uh, there's a large hysteresis that we observe. And again, in the decomposition, we never observe complete decomposition of all of our silicon carbide going to silicon plus carbon. And so, you know, this is partly because of the experimental setup, right? So when you're heating diamond cell experiments, you're not gonna be leaving it there for hours. It's gonna be seconds, maybe minutes, if you're kind of risky. Um, and so getting to achieve equilibrium um, in these systems is something that would be really interesting. All right, so now moving on to work that we did on silicon carbide plus other elements, right? So this picture that I have here um, this is actually an image of the composition of our atmosphere, but it just so happens to also correspond to the elements that we looked at, right? So these large boxes mainly. We did some experiments on silicon carbide plus oxygen and then silicon carbide plus nitrogen, right? So, of course, you know, if we want to think about silicon carbide in a planet, it's extremely unrealistic to just look at pure silicon carbide. Of course, there will be many, many other elements, right? So this plot is looking at the um, abundance of elements in our solar system, right? And so the elements that we chose to experiment with uh, were oxygen and nitrogen, right? Two abundant elements that we have. Right, and so the first set of experiments um, I'm going to talk about are exploring if silicon carbide can coexist with oxygen-rich phases inside of a planet. Right, so every time I go to a conference, this is what people would always say, would be, all right, yeah, great, you're looking at silicon carbide, but what happens if you put oxygen in there? Will it just go away completely? And it's, I mean, it's a good point. So this is a schematic of what our experiments looked like. So this, you know, artist's impression of a diamond cell. Uh, these blue are the diamonds. These red, uh, this is representing the laser heating. Down here is showing our sample assembly with neon as our pressure medium. And our sample consisting of silicon carbide and silica mixed together, right? So what we decided to look at was reactions between silicon carbide and silica at high pressures and temperatures. And we opted to use different concentrations in order to see if there was a difference with how much silica you had, right? So we explored a one-to-one -one silicon carbide to silica mass ratio, um, 10 to one, 50 to one. And then we also looked at a layered sample so looking at a silicon carbide layer next to a silica layer. Right, we explored a number of pressure and temperature conditions. So looking at temperatures up to 25, well, 2000, 2500 Kelvin, pressures between 10 and 40 GPA. Right, and so if we put the diffraction results, which actually showed up kind of grainy on here, Right, so I have results here from two of the mixtures, the one-to-one -one mixture and the 10-to-one -one mixture. And so looking here um, at the one-to-one -one mixture, right, again, D space is on the bottom axis. I think the label got cut off, right? And this bottom pattern, this is the preheat pattern where you can clearly see silicon carbide diffraction, neon diffraction, and you don't see silica yet because we loaded an amorphous silica sample. 
the silica comes up after the sample heats, right? And now you start to see these stishovite peaks, which is the high pressure form of silica. All right, and so we heat this up to 2000 degrees, 2500 Kelvin in some cases, quench the sample, and then see, do we observe any reactions? Um, and so we end up, we don't really see that much happening, right? We still see silica, we still see silicon carbide. The new phase we observe is again that carbon diamond, indicating that the silicon carbide is you know, still breaking up, there's still carbon coming out. Um, and these results are pretty much identical for the 10 to 1 mixture. Um, and I don't have it shown here, but it's also very similar for the 50 to 1 and then the layered mixture. So that we don't really see any oxidation reactions happening with these compositions at these pressures and temperatures. Right, but we can look at the effect on melting or decomposition of silicon carbide in these systems. Um, and so here I have the um, pressure temperature conditions where we start seeing carbon diffraction in these experiments over plotted on you know, this tie dye phase diagram from before. Right, and it's largely consistent with that transition that we had seen in the pure silicon carbide experiments. Some of them are a little bit lower um, but yeah, it's hard to say if there really is an effect of oxygen. It seems to be that silicon carbide is still breaking up at a similar temperature. Right, but the other thing we observe, which is interesting, um, so once we go through, we take our diffraction patterns, we get our quench patterns. I went through and found the volumes of silicon carbide and stishovite in all of these quench patterns. And what I observed was that there's actually some variation in the zero pressure volume, right? So what I have plotted here, looking at lattice parameter in angstroms on the y-axis, right? So my top pattern is looking at the silicon carbide lattice parameter. These two bottom um, graphs, these are looking at the stishovite lattice parameter, right, A and C. And what we see is that in different samples, right, this first gray um, column is in the layered sample, there is an oscillation um, of the silicon carbide zero pressure lattice parameter, which corresponds to where in the quench patterns it got hot and it got cold, or it was stayed cold. So we, these are from maps across the sample, right? And then when you look at and that when you look at these, the silicon carbide is largely smaller than you would expect it to be. Correspondingly, the silica is a little bit larger than you would expect it to be in a lot of these patterns, with most of the changes happening in the A parameter, the lattice parameter. All right, so that if you then look at the volume deviation, and compare how silicon carbide and silica are deviating from their expected volumes, you see that silicon carbide is generally on the smaller side. It's a little bit smaller than you would expect. And silica is a little bit larger. So what this may mean and how we interpret these results is that this, when carbon comes out of silicon carbide, right, so with these hot, temperatures, we're observing the appearance of carbon diamond. Some of this carbon, when it comes out, is decreasing the volume of silicon carbide, but that some of it is being incorporated into silica, expanding the volume. And this is consistent with previous studies looking at carbon incorporation into silica, where they find that the largest change is in the A lattice parameter rather than the C lattice parameter. And so we may be seeing carbon incorporation into the silica. Right, and so just for fun now, we took this information and said, what if we had a planet made of silicon, carbon, and oxygen? Right, so again, here I have density versus pressure. Right, now I have those same carbon, silica, silicon carbide, 
looking at how their density jumps over phase transitions as you increase pressure. Now I've also added silica to this plot, right? And so if we're thinking about building a planet, the denser things will sink, the less dense things will rise to form layers in the most, you know, the simplest way you could possibly look at this. And when you try to pick it out of this plot, it just, you know, there's everything's crossing each other. It's just looks like a mess. Right, and if you try to put it into a planet mantle structure, it still kind of looks like a mess, right? These layers, the relative densities jump around so much that you end up getting a, an onion planet with silicon and carbon um, layers kind of stacking. And then this carbon saturated SiO2 down at the bottom, right? And so, of course, the difference between these two images is whether or not silicon carbide will break up at high pressure, right? That B1 structure, not sure if it decomposes or not, so both scenarios are shown here. All right, so results from these oxygen experiments, just to sum these up, right? So we, where, where we explored, we saw no evidence of oxidation between SIC and SiO2. Um, of course, if you explored other conditions, this might be different. Um, right, so what we saw was that it can coexist with silica within a planet's interior at these pressure temperature conditions, um, but that it does continue to decompose and that the decomposition products, mainly carbon, um, might be incorporating into silica. Right, so continuing with the last um, study I'll talk about today is looking at nitrogen. Right, so here's another schematic, and I have to say these experiments happened by accident at first, right? So we were loading silicon carbide um, and wanting to use argon as the pressure medium, but in order to load argon, we would cool it down with liquid nitrogen. And in one of these experiments, some nitrogen made it into our sample by mistake. All right, so when we heated it up and saw these reactions, it took a very long time to try to figure out what was actually happening here, right? But so what we have for our sample scenario here, silicon carbide loaded with a mixture of argon and nitrogen, which we then heat up and take to the synchrotron, right? So the diffraction patterns that we observe from these experiments looking at silicon carbide and nitrogen, right? So our starting pattern here, argon, silicon carbide as expected, and then these nitrogen diffraction lines here. These are high pressure forms of nitrogen. Right, so this is at low temperature. And then once we heat it up, right, so these two diffraction patterns here are quenched from 1700 Kelvin in the middle, and then quenched from 3000 Kelvin up at the top. Right, and so these red lines these red um, yeah, barcodes, they highlight new peaks that are appearing in the patterns, right? And these correspond to silicon nitride, right? This is the cubic form, the high pressure form of silicon nitride that we see coming up really strongly. And this corresponds to the disappearance of the nitrogen diffraction, um, and as well as it corresponds with the appearance of carbon diamond. So what we're seeing is that the silicon carbide and nitrogen is reacting to form silicon nitride and carbon, right? So for these experiments, we do see a reaction. And that when you take these samples and then quench them both from pressure and temperature, uh, these phases remain, right? We still have that cubic silicon nitride and that carbon diamond. And this is also consistent with previous work which saw that silicon nitride you know, quenches um, to zero pressure after it's been formed. Right, so if we put a, together a phase diagram of you know, this silicon carbon nitrogen system that we're looking at, um, these circular data points and then this square 
correspond to where we see silicon nitride formation. So again, it's fairly consistent with the previous data shown in X's here of where we saw the beginning of decomposition. Right, and so if you put this, you know, compare it to planetary conditions, looking at Earth geotherms, we're right around where, um, where the Earth's mantle sits. Right, but what's, what's interesting is that if you look at ambient pressure data, the opposite phase stability is present. So that at high temperatures, silicon carbide and nitrogen is the stable phase at low pressures, which is opposite of what we see when pressure is increased. We see that silicon nitride and carbon is the stable high temperature phase. All right, so we did some computations to explore this this crossover, right, which I have highlighted in the red arrows here. And so to do this, we use VASP, the Vienna Ab Initio simulation package, and did some you know, pretty simple computations looking at the equation of state for the components of this reaction, looking at silicon carbide plus nitrogen goes to silicon nitride plus carbon. And we did this to calculate the enthalpy of the products versus the reactants with pressure to get a sense of if we can recreate this crossover in stable phases, right? And lo and behold, spoiler alert, we do, right? So this plot is looking at pressure um, with enthalpy on the y-axis, right? And so here, the solid line is the silicon carbide plus nitrogen. The dotted line is the silicon nitride plus carbon. Right, and so we do see that at low pressures, silicon carbide and nitrogen is more stable, but that this changes as pressure increases. Right, and so of course this pressure that we find is not you know, perfectly consistent with our experiments, um, but these computations were done at zero degrees Kelvin, so it's possible that the discrepancy could come from something related to temperature. All right, and so if we take you know, these results, looking at silicon carbide and nitrogen going to silicon nitride plus carbon and applying it to a planet, you know, we can go wild with cartoons and try to imagine what this would mean for planetary atmospheres. Right, so this top panel here, this is looking at planets that do not have silicon carbide. Right, so there's nothing to bond with the nitrogen on a planet such as Earth. So this FO2 above MOOC, this is pretty much oxygen fugacity that's too high to form silicon carbide. The M in that acronym stands for moissanite. Right, and so in these um, planets that are oxygen rich, no silicon carbide, um, nitrogen is outgassed, right? And from there, you end up with you know, a nitrogen-rich atmosphere, right? But in this bottom panel, this is meant to represent the conditions that we're looking at in our experiments, where you have a low enough oxygen fugacity that silicon carbide is part of your planet. You're one of these carbon-rich planets, right? And so in this case, silicon carbide is reacting with all of the nitrogen in the mantle, making silicon nitride. And this silicon nitride is a very stable mantle phase, meaning that it's sequestering nitrogen in this planet, preventing it from being outgassed, and resulting in a planet with a nitrogen poor atmosphere. So that um, there's actually an observable difference between a carbon rich silicon carbide planet and an oxygen rich Earth like planet, and that that observable might be nitrogen in the atmosphere, right? And so, you know, does this kind of work in our solar system? Um, so here I'm looking at, down here, this colored plot. This is looking at um, oxygen fugacity with that MOOC, again, being the oxygen fugacity low enough to form silicon carbide, right? And so if you look at the, some of the rocky planets and moons in our solar system, most of them have nitrogen in their atmosphere, right? Earth, Mars, Venus, Titan has a lot of nitrogen. And all of these planets are, you know, they have high 
higher oxygen fugacities in their mantle then um, would allow the formation of silicon carbide. All right, so the only planet we have that's reduced enough to potentially um, be one of these kind of funky planets is Mercury, right, where nitrogen is not detected. All right, so the observations and experiments put the oxygen fugacity of Mercury's mantle somewhere at around iron wistite minus five to seven, so not quite at this MOOC boundary, but still very reduced. And so while, of course, Mercury has a, you know, a complicated history and not much atmosphere, but it's possible that Mercury could have some of these silicon nitrides and that, you know, on other solar systems, you can also find these planets, right? So for conclusions for this part, so silicon carbide can coexist with silica right, possibly other silicate phases at the conditions that we studied, um, but not with nitrogen, right, and so that a planet with silicon carbide might have dramatically different phases, particularly nitrogen phases, as compared to one without, meaning that nitrogen could be a key in helping to identify one of these planets. Right, and so since you know, I've done this work. A lot of other recent studies have also been done on silicon carbide in a planetary context. So just three here that I'm highlighting is, you know, studies looking at silicon carbide oxidation um, that came out two years ago. Another study looking at silicon carbide and iron, right? So looking at the reactions between silicon carbide and iron within a planetary body. Um, and then some recent abstracts coming out looking at silicon carbide and water, which is another really interesting system to consider. So, yeah, so there's lots of work trying to build one of these silicon carbide planets and mainly understanding silicon carbide at high pressures and temperatures. All right, so to conclude, right, kinetics is very important for silicon carbide systems, especially on an experimental time scale, right? So on a planetary time scale, you will presumably be achieving equilibrium. And so things that we're observing, like the decomposition of silicon carbide, um, these high pressure transitions would lead to interesting structure um, and interesting chemistry. Right, and so some of these unique chemistry fingerprints, these might be the key to identifying a planet that would be containing silicon carbide. Um, and so what we're finding is that this may be done through its influence on the atmosphere composition, particularly nitrogen. Yeah, and so thanks for, thanks for inviting me. I guess, does anyone have any questions? Thank you, Kirsten, for an uh, exceptionally clear talk on the uh, explanation of the experiments to the planetary implications. I'm sure there are both questions. Yeah. Please just speak up or put your question in the chat. If I escape this, maybe I'll, can you still see the slide? Uh, this is Roald here. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Yes. Uh, so, um, one of the remarkable things about silicon carbide, of course, is that it exists, that it's so much more interesting than diamond, because it exists in all these polymorphs, which we have so yeah. far not been able to make for carbon. Um, yeah. Now, uh, which of these I missed the very beginning of some of this. So one question is, uh, the, for the transformation to the rock salt structure, which is so important um, uh, under pressure, which polymorph of silicon carbide did you do and would it be very different for the other ones? Yeah, so our experiments were all, for that transition, all on the cubic polymorph, so the V3 structure. Um, there is a shock study, I think by Sakeen et al, that looked at the 6H hexagonal structure and also observed that transition. Um, yeah, so I imagine that 
the kinetics might be different depending on which polymorph you started with, right? Since the, if I pull up this slide, right? Since the difference between these polymorphs is pretty much just the stacking of the silicon carbon tetrahedra. Um, and so we were looking at the cubic structure, the B3 structure, right? But yeah, depending on which polymorph you start with, and depending on how much time you give for the transition to happen, you might find that it might take longer or yeah, happen in a, a slightly yeah. different way. There are also computational work that looks at the 6 stage structure too. I don't think, I, I think there are very different, there are different ways of saying it. One way is there are very different modes, the phonon modes involved if this were a single crystal to single crystal transformation from yeah. one of the diamond phases to the rock salt structure. Mm -hmm. And um, we actually traced one for a rather different system, which is cadmium selenide. But oh. um, I think these are fairly strong bonds that are being manipulated. And so uh, it may make a difference. It's not just atoms at random sliding over just to the most state structure. Um, yeah, no, I guess we need to do some experiments then. <laughs> Look at these two. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Michael Dimpowitz has a question. Do you want to ask it? Oh, it's really more of a comment. Um, I uh, a little bit of work on not not high pressure work, but but radiation effects work on amorphous silicon oxycarbide, which can which is a compound of silicon oxygen and carbon that can be made by physical vapor deposition or pyrolysis, and it's unstable, so it's not it's not thermodynamically stable. So if kinetics is an issue, and if, if investigating kinetics is an issue, it might be interesting to try. Uh, yeah, non I actually have. Like I actually have some experiments. We actually got some silicon oxycarbide and um, did high pressure experiments on it. The just haven't analyzed and written the data up yet. But yeah, it is a is some of it. It's kind of interesting. Some of it we don't quite understand yet, which is partly why it hasn't been written up yet. But yeah. that's very cool. Alex great, great talk. has under the auspices of the Deep Carbon Observatory looked into that and yeah. written some papers on that. Maybe yeah. got materials from her, but anyway, that group had done some nice work on that a few years ago. So good question. Yeah. More questions? It's Roald. I have another a comment also. In the, the oxygen and silicon carbide work is very interesting. Uh, if kinetics is important, I would um, think also about another possible product, which is silicon monoxide. That's not what you usually think of because silicon dioxide is so stable. But just to make the point in another context, just because CO2 is so stable does not mean that carbon monoxide does not uh, exist and is kinetically stable. So we have predicted some structures for silicon monoxide under high pressure. None of them ever get near stability of silicon dioxide, but they are interesting in their, in their shapes. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's interesting you bring that up because I think that we've actually I looked through your, your structures for the silicon oxycarbide experiments that we were doing, because there are some peaks that we can't explain. And so trying to see if they make sense with silicon monoxide, um, still kind of inconclusive, but it is, a, it is an interesting point that you bring up. I was intrigued by your evidence for uh, carbon incorporation in stichovite, and mm -hmm. one question is, how much do you think you can dissolve in stichovite or SiO2, and this includes the higher pressure phases, um, 
could be based on calculations or some kind of systematics. Have you thought about that? And another question is, how dry were these experiments? That is, can incorporate hydrogen and they survive as well. So if you have water present plus the silicon dioxide, could that be an effect? It's a more complicated system. But it also could affect yeah. the so two questions. Yeah. Yeah, no, good questions. So we we did our best to dry the samples out as much as possible. So before compressing, we would always put the diamond cells in the oven to kind of hopefully dry out overnight. Um, so hopefully there isn't too much um, water present. One of those um, additional work studies that I mentioned was an abstract from AGU last year that was looking at silicon carbide in water. I actually saw some indication of what looked like methane from this reaction. Um, so if you have a lot of water, that might show up in the diffraction, um, maybe as a methane um, material, right? But so in terms of looking at the amount of carbon in stichiavite, we didn't do a calculation to see just how much it was, right? So our volume deviation is it's pretty small, right? So these, if this is zero and these are the percent deviation from that zero pressure volume. Um, it's not huge, though it does vary. So we are probably at, or at least I think because we also see carbon diamond, we're at kind of a saturation point. So I don't know. Um, yeah, and it's also hard because these are from quench patterns from a map of the hotspot. So they're likely sampling different temperatures that were experienced in each different pattern. So this solubility of carbon into SiO2, if it is temperature dependent, we're probably sampling a lot of different temperatures in just this quench pattern across the hotspot. So it's kind of hard to pin down exactly um, what is contributing to that solubility because there's different temperature conditions kind of at these pressures. If that makes sense. Uh -huh. Sure. There was another question from Michael about uh, doing diffusion couple experiments in diamond cells. In fact, that's been done over the years. They're difficult. Did you perhaps think about that. You look at diffusion across an interface at high pressure temperatures and then from microanalysis look at compositional maps. So we, we didn't do too much with diffusion um, mostly because yeah I think it would be fairly difficult to do not impossible but you'd have to be kind of very careful in your loading, your heating, and then how you cross-section and analyze it afterwards. Um, so we haven't considered or done that yet, but you know, it would be interesting. Okay, more questions? If not, thank you again for a beautiful talk. Yeah, no, Stay safe, you know. a very safe part of the world. Yes, thank you. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. It's okay. great to be able to, to zoom in. Right, this worked very well. Have a good rest of the day. Thanks, you too.